Hello, and welcome to From the Rookery End. We've been here before. We've been here before a lot. Uh, my name is John, uh, and uh, we're recording this on Sunday night, uh, 24 hours or so after Watford lost at home 2-1 to Coventry City. And not quite, but just about 24 hours since we heard the news that Valerian Ishmael has been sacked as Watford manager, and Tom Cleverley is coming in as interim or head coach. We're going to talk about that, surprisingly, because uh, we like to talk about things on this podcast. Uh, I'm joined this evening by Mike. John, all I can say is thank heaven for the for the Hemel storm, because on Saturday, <laughs> Watford lost a, a big game. Cheshire United, who are currently top in their division, they played second place and lost their game. Wheelstone, who I enjoy going to see as well, they lost in the quarterfinals of the FA Trophy. Wembley was hoving into view for, for the Stones. They lost on penalties. So all the sort of teams have got a passing interest in lost. And then along came Hemel Storm taking on the top of the table, Derby Trailblazers, and they won an absolute barn burner of a game. But what cost it came at? Because I am sat here with, I'm no doctor or physician, but if I haven't badly bruised my coccyx or whatever it's it's called, I'm I'm in absolute agony. So the basically, Hemel were one point down with 1.2 seconds to go. So basically, they had one play to to win the game, 1.2 seconds to do it. Um, they decided on the play, they went for it, and they won. And it was the most, it was just extraordinary. It was one of the most brilliant sporting experiences um, I've had. But I went to celebrate and put my foot where I thought there was a step to sort of uh, push off to to launch myself into the air to celebrate. There was nothing there, so my air collapsed. My foot, my foot just hit thin air. I went um, A over T, landed flat on my back. I was like an upturned turtle. My jumper had ridden up my... Oh, it was the most undignified <laughs> way of celebrating sporting triumph ever known. And it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty painful today. But uh, yeah, great fun. Again, I'd say it. Get yourself down to the Storm Dome. If you, if you fancy your basketball, it's, um, it's, it's really good fun. But thank heaven for them. Otherwise, it would have been a pretty dismal sporting day. You say dismal. I think it's a Michael Parkin day of uh, of uh, sporting this. <laughs> <laughs> it gives you opportunities, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Jason, how are you? I'm good. I, and Mike, if you want some sporting cheer, this is a bit of a bit of a boast, really. But um, as you know, I like my my running. Um, and yesterday, my 168th park run was actually my best age graded score park run ever. Oh. And, uh, Mike, please don't start backing me because you know, <laughs> I, I fear it'll all go south. But uh, yeah, it wasn't such a bad sporting day for me. I, I've got a little thing to cheer there. If I could yeah. celebrate, Jace, I would, but I, can't, I literally can't get out of my chair <laughs> without, it, without it causing absolute agony. So there, there is a photograph, and we will share that on our social medias. You can't really see Mike at all, but you can see his, you can you can tell the position he's in, and you can see his feet. It is um, the best sporting photograph I've seen in a long time. <laughs> but 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 um, you say I was at a quiz night last night. I was hosting it, and then uh, you know just intense and all that went. And just taking scores in, and then just as they leave, I look at my phone and oh. <laughs> well, I'm not surprised. And in fact, we we sort of been waiting to do this podcast for a while. About two weeks ago, when we lost at home to Huddersfield, we were discussing exactly how we would deal with this this moment that we now find ourselves in with yet another head coach being sacked by uh, Gino Pozzo. I'm going to say that, not by the club, I'm going to say by Gino Pozzo. Um, Mike, let's get out of the way. Let's get, mm. if Coxix is in a bad place, let's get your head <laughs> in a better place. Um, seeing the news... Where are you? How are you feeling? I like pretty much everyone listening, John. I'm pretty sure I wasn't wasn't surprised. And like you say, we have been waiting to say that game was the one that broke the, the was the straw that the, broke the camel's back for a couple of weeks. Now we've seen abject performances at, at Huddersfield, Millwall, uh, and now we've thrown it away against uh, Coventry. It wasn't that much better against Swansea either. So no surprise. But also, I'd kind of insulated myself to the on-field performances because I'm sort of more worried about the the bigger picture. So how do I feel about the sacking? Unsurprised, disappointed, it's ended like that. But my my overarching concern is, you mentioned him there, John, is with with the owner. Um, And we find ourselves in this position because because of him, quite frankly. My concern is about the direction that this football club is travelling and, and probably has been for some some time really. If you look at what Valerian Ishmael had to had to play with, it was a 
a diminished squad, really, wasn't it? It was. We probably had eleven decent enough players for a championship side, but we're lacking a striker, lack, lack, just lacking any sort of depth. So he was dealt a bit of a a dud hand, really. And this side is worse than the one before from the season before, and worse than the one from the season before that. And that is because Gino Pozzo is evidently investing less money into the football club. It is. Well, I was going to say one in, one out. It's not even. It's not even that, is it? It's the, the money going into the playing side is is lower than it ever has been. There's money going out because I think I was at I was at Millwall. The the when was that last weekend? Gino Pozzo was stuck that stuck, sat there with everybody's uh, favourite agent. Um, you can bet your bottom dollar that he's had a few quid sloshing around from various transfers that that Watford have made. The fact that he's still knocking around, I think, is a is a bit of a middle finger, effectively, to to us as Watford supporters. It shows that he's not really bothered about what we think. Um, people have spoken about that that particular agent at length. There's stuff in the public domain. You don't need me to to rehash it, but we know that as agents go, potentially, that might be one that you wouldn't want to be associated with. Yet here we are in a situation where money is an absolute premium. It would appear for the for the playing side of things um, and we're finding money for, for particular people and we're not finding money for the team. And it is just diminishing, uh, diminishing investment and diminishing returns. And it feels like we're just at the start of, well, we're mid slippery slope. And either my fear is that it's going to start picking up pace and things are going to get bad pretty, pretty quickly. I think, People always ask me, are you Pozzo out, Mike? Are you Pozzo out? Do you want him gone? And look, I think there's a vanishingly few people at this stage who wouldn't welcome either new investment or a new owner. That I, th- I think I, if, if no one agrees with that, I'd be I'd be surprised. I think he's wanted out for a long time. Um, but it's almost like shouting at him is, is like shouting at someone who's put their house on the market to sell your house. He mm. wants out. He's trying to sell the club. You need a buyer that's going to come in with a certain amount of of capital that's able to to meet the losses and is able to pay back what what Gino needs to to get his money back. It's 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 not easy to find those people as we're finding out. There's just nothing visible or public happening in that in that regard. So, how do I feel about the manager going? Tired, jaded, a little bit apathetic to be perfectly honest because we've known it's coming. But it is the inevitable result of how the football club is being being run at the moment. And, and and in all honesty, how the football club has probably always been run. I think it's starting to become clear that potentially Gino Pozzo didn't necessarily quite know what he was doing when it kept when it in terms of getting promoted and, and staying in the division. We ended up with us with some really, really good players. But it, it's starting to look more by luck than than judgment. And I just worry about the the financial stability of the club. I worry about the direction of travel. I'd made peace with what was happening on the on the on the pitch. If I was of the opinion that if we could stay up, that's fine. I can just need to get to summer and then potentially regroup and and try and think about where the where the football club is going. But I I'm long term massively massively concerned. Short term, just exhausted really. Yeah, it it is that, and I suppose Jason. Yesterday was the the culmination of of many things. Um, I I, I'm, I don't want to use the word better. I suppose I want to say not as bad as before. <laughs> and over the last couple of weeks, the hardest feels like the lowest, um, mm. and that's why we felt it was the time that he was going to go. And we start talking about doing this podcast. I think it's the longest prep we've ever done, maybe for a podcast. <laughs> Those are two weeks where we wait for this to happen. And you know, we've seen Sunderland, uh, Swansea this week, and we've seen the Coventry visit Vicarage Road um, yesterday. And you know, let, let's talk about, about, about Val and, and, and his exit because what Mike said so far is not going anywhere, not yet. But in terms of that that game, I turned to you early on. I said, you know, with this idea in her head that you know he's, he's yeah maybe fighting for his job. Do you think he's made those changes, Jason? Because He's trying something different. And you replied. And I replied, and I remember what I replied, because I'm an old man these days. Um, I think it was just it was just he was just filling the gaps that that were there, weren't he? I don't I don't think he'd made changes because he wanted to try something different. It was it, Semmer 
out because he's injured, Livermore out because he was poorly, and just sort of plugged those gaps, really. I, di- I didn't feel like there was anything different. I suppose Dennis through the middle instead of bio, but yeah, um, I'm not sure what, what that achieves, really, or what it did achieve. And going back to your point where you said it wasn't as bad as before, I think we said within the group yesterday that um, obviously the team started cooking, uh, kicking towards the rookery end. Yeah. Um, did Was that our choice? Did we win the toss and decide that yeah. we would do that because we've started games so slowly? Do we think that kicking towards the rookery end will, will mean a faster start? And I, I think it did to an extent. Um it took a few minutes to get going, but once we got going, we looked good. And when, when we scored, I think we deserved it. We would have been yeah, able to take them at that point. By the time they scored their penalty, I, I thought we were we were long in need of half time. Yeah. Uh, it was it was probably those last ten minutes we were we were up against it. Um and it was almost like we'd Coventry had sort of got a, a, a sort of foothold in there. They'd, they'd started to settle a bit themselves, and and we kind of just sort of went all oh, back into our shell. Yeah. Um, go on in, Coventry. Over to you. And it was I want to you know we, we'll talk about the second half in a bit, Mike. But I suppose I, I'm not talking about this saying hi guys. Uh, can we find the positives in this? Uh, <laughs> just as I, well. There are there are still nine games going this season. So seeing what we saw, the positives again not really positives, the good things, the better things from that first half, I think for me was, and that's why the one change he'd done, which felt really worthwhile was Chat for Tatsy. You know, mm-hmm. him coming on and him, after what we saw he added against Swansea, he added that energy. And I suppose there's a little bit of, when you see it, you know, someone who likes to run and add a bit to it and be energetic, you think, well, are you going to start a game or could you last a whole game? You know, is it better you to come off the subs bench? All those sorts of thoughts. But he, he, he was purposeful, and I think he made Jamal Lewis better. Yeah, you know those partnerships on the on the sides can really be important. So very important, I think, to it when it comes to success. The other one, who I believe played a did a great role in his third role of the season, was um, Tom Delibishiru, who you know playing in that anchor role, which I haven't seen him play before. But him and Kembe sort of can be back to where he he had been. There were positives. To come out yeah. of that first half, the, the first half was was well, certainly the first, or well, maybe the middle half hour of the of the first half because I think Cov were were on top initially. We it took us a little while to find our uh, find our feet, but it, it it was much better. And I think let's deal with uh, Tom Delhi and and Kiembe. Tom Delhi Bashiri, who's shown himself to be an able teammate I think this season I think that's the one thing you can say about him he's played in different roles and he, for me he's grown in stature he looks big he looks comfortable he looks strong um I don't think he lets down at all really when he played at right back and in and in midfield midfield he can look big and and dominating and alongside KMB they work quite well you're right about Jamal Lewis in that first half I think he looked significantly better than he has done in in previous outings when he's been far too um, meek and timid and just off the pace going forward and sort of not strong enough in that left back role either defensively but yeah the man of the first half was was Chak Fatadze and coming off the back of his struggle to say game changing cameo against Swansea but he was the the sort of blue touch paper that got things going as much as anyone anyone did against Swansea he so he's come in obviously full of confidence sensible call from uh, from Valerian Ismail, the former Watford head coach, to, uh, <laughs> to to bring him on. And just the way he cut inside and he was moving pr- past players really, really comfortably. But do you, you know what that was? It was just a desire to get forward. And we simply, and I was going to say, I sort of, I think you are, someone asked, do you, do you feel, is, has, has Valerian Ismail been a little bit unlucky? And he was to a degree because Kov really surprised me, actually. Incredibly aggressive, lots of sort of, pretty agricultural challenges and madly sort of clamped down on a couple. But then Chak Vatanza got absolutely clattered with, what, I don't know, five, six minutes to go to yeah. half time. The ref didn't even give a free kick, let alone a a, a, a yellow card. And that was ultimately to prov- prove enough to see Chak Vatanza coming off at half time. And I thought, oh, 
that that is just how's your luck, Val? You you are fighting for your job. We all knew he was, and it felt like that that was a half or at least two thirds of a half of football that might help him tick along. Because I felt personally, to be honest, I thought that that Watford were going to try and stick with him. I thought Gino and Scott, whoever's pulling the the strings, uh, wanted to wanted him to see it to see it through as as we did. But so I felt uh, if if this was his last throw of the dice, for at times. It was looking all right, but as soon as Chakwetadze went off in that second half, we I said in our in our WhatsApp group we cannot revert to type, and we it, that's exactly what we did. And you always have to look at the opposition. Coventry danders up decent players. They brought on good substitutes. Uh, when O'Hare comes on, you know that you've got a decent uh, depth of squad. But we just as soon as they equalised, you knew, you knew, and. That's. I think the players' confidence is absolutely through the floor. How much of that can be attributed to Valerian Ismail? Well, you have to say a fair bit because of the way we were set up to play, the way they're obviously instructed to play. The fact that someone in the shape of Chak Fatadze was coming on and a few jinky runs forward were going, oh, wow, this is great. That's what That's what players mm, should be doing yeah. of the quality we've got. So, yeah, it was they, good performances from those guys in in parts. But again, it was just, I said, this is just a slow amble towards inevitable defeat. And so it proved. Jace? Mike mentioned that he thought Gino might actually stick with him. I, I've i been wondering if he was just going to wait for the international break. Because um, that would be typical Pozzo standard mm. manager change to do it in an international break. Instead, if he's not rushed into it, because reports were coming about out about this happening two weeks ago. I'm not sure, cleverly coming in as interim manager, normally, again, with the typical Pots of MO, they've got the next man lined up. Have the performances, actually, if he's sitting there with his finger on the trigger, he's just got a bit too twitchy and twitched earlier than he thought he would do. The only thing I thought about that timing was the fact that we've got Birmingham next week. And then if you look at the run of games that we've got into the end of the season, that is the last, really, club that we play play that is below us in the league. So that might be the reason why the last throw of the dice was was happening there. You're right, yeah. Jace. It's interesting that you know the, the appointment of Tom will get to you know about him importantly, but you're right in terms of that. You know the man he wanted. This is apart from the very very ends of the season, or for a couple of games in the middle between manage uh, between head coaches. It's the only time they have ever appointed someone till for for not say nine ten games as an interim. So they clearly don't know or the person they want is going to be better available um fairly or in the in the summer. Yeah, it's a diffi- it's a difficult time to to for a for a head coach to take over. I, I think in terms of what Gino's done, he's just reverted to type. He the fix it is and we've defended him over the years. You know, I I or usually put a message out on social media, don't bother doing a joke about Watford managers or head coaches because we've heard them all before, sort of kind of sticking up for ourselves a little bit. Last couple of times I haven't bothered because what's the point? We can't really defend it anymore. Changing manager is a tactic. Yeah. It's not a sort of strategic change of direction or anything like that. It is when they want something to happen quickly. That's what he does. He changes the the manager. It worked on the way up. It definitely hasn't worked on the way down. And I think he's they they panicked is is right because they're looking at the league table and thinking right we actually only need probably one win will do it mm. um as you said john birmingham is it's now a massive game really really difficult one for for tom to go into st andrews will be absolutely bouncing it'll be full it's a massive game for them they will fancy it they'll be looking to win to get to get themselves out of a little bit of a little bit of trouble but they i think will have looked at that and think right if we're going to have a new manager bounce it needs to be against a team that is potentially one we can get one we can get points about because that that is that's what they know that's what he thinks works changing changing head coach and what's interesting is i'm i'm just surprised it didn't happen sooner really and and i i wonder what whether it's linked to not having anyone lined up not having wanting to pay anyone uh, mm. to to come in i'm sure yeah. the deal with valerian ishmael was structured in a way that severance wouldn't be wouldn't be too expensive knowing what they know about uh, about about finance uh, and and their precarious situation and not wanting too many um, unplanned outlays. So you've got to work on the basis that that contract has been severed with minimal 
financial impact. But who who can they get in at this stage for not much money? Quite frankly, um, I don't know who's out there. I know Walter Mazzari left uh, left Napoli, didn't he, recently? But um, <laughs> well, the big uh, one was uh, was yes, Colin. Mate. Colin Warner leaving Aberdeen after yeah. winning. I mean, maybe you know the, the the commuting up to Aberdeen was too much for him. But if that happened, that <laughs> perhaps he's going to advise Tom. Yeah, yeah. it'd be uh, brilliantly but, amazing. And, and, <laughs> and I wonder annoying. whether the fact that he's been announced as interim is. I, I'm not sure whether he's got all his the requisite coaching badges or not. So maybe that maybe that's something that, that well, feeds that was, into it. Was, this, was Cisco was going to the Premier League? You don't. The only the certain one by yeah, the time you were in the Premier sure. League, but remember, Cisco was he had the he was doing the badges, so he was that's why he was allowed to coach in the Premier League because he was finishing, he was in the middle of doing his badges. That was that was okay. Yeah, you, you're right. Yeah, we'll have to check that out, and I should have done my homework before before yes. mentioning it. But <laughs> but as usual, there's a lots of lots of variables, but none of them are particularly. Look, I'm d- delighted for for Tom. I hope he, uh, I hope he, I hope he does well. And to see him progressing in the game is is great. I wanted to touch on something just in terms of the timing of things because Andrew French wrote an interesting piece in the in the Watford Observer about the January transfer window, and that looked like a a, a sort of net loss, really well, net loss for us in terms of players. It definitely wasn't a net loss for other individuals. I'm I'm sure, but. Um, <laughs> It looked like a bit of a disaster. A, a, a sort of semi-fit Dennis was the only person that came in, loser, and Reese Healy went went out. And Andrew in the Watford Observer wrote a piece sort of confirming that Valerian Ishmael had gone to Gino with a specific list of players that he wanted, with specific attributes, and was told that we can't get those players for whatever reason, um, whether the deal couldn't be done, too much money, the play, whatever. It, it, they, they couldn't. They hit a brick wall, and but offered him other players of the similar profile. So taking on board what he said, tried to get the players he wanted, couldn't get them, but offered him next best or as close as they could. And and Andrew's piece was very clear saying that he said no. He turned his nose up at anyone other than the exact players that he said he wanted. So that's an interesting development, yeah. quite an interesting mm. um, so nugget. That, that says to me he's putting his foot down because whatever the relationship is with the two of them, you know, that isn't a a, a two-way street. That isn't a, well, maybe not respectable, but that isn't, yeah, almost like he's trying to goad him. You know, Gino is doing what I need because I'm the head coach and if you're backing me, then you need to do this. And and that's interesting, like, you know, not if it is, here's my list of five, and they go, none of those five. Rather than actually, well, we'll work on. Well, let's you know some sort of you know two way sort of discussion about who the the player should be and which one's the priorities, and we'll try and get that player of yours. But yeah, headspace in in a yeah clearly their headspaces weren't in in a line, and that's with the thing you'd hoped. And and the problem that we've had is, well, especially when it comes to transfers, two two of the main directors and two main men running have gone uh, this season. One has come back. And it did feel like, you know, what, what everyone was saying, our friend Moji, you know, he was being talked about as in we're moving past him now by the pr- people who were here previously. But then they, they'd they gone by this January transfer window. So evidently not the case. But yeah, I, I, th- I think that the fact of that is, is talking about Jason and Jason was talking about the timing and whether whether Gino was was hanging on. You know full well how Gino would have reacted to being told that I don't want the, these players that you're you you and your team are are suggesting. I've no doubt that um, despite him probably fitting the profile um, of the Emmanuel Dennis of a couple of years ago fits the profile of what what um, uh, um, Ishmael would have wanted. That I've got, I'm sure there's no way he would have wanted Emmanuel Dennis in the the football club. One win, by the way, since he arrived we had a long conversation about the impact that that Emmanuel Dennis potentially might have for stability for Ishmael's future and not can't attribute it to, to, to Emmanuel Dennis entirely but the form has gone off a cliff since he arrived uh, and the boss has disappeared so perhaps we were um, perhaps we were right to raise a, a, a few concerns but Gino would have had his nose put out of joint by by Valerian Ishmael it's quite a ballsy move from Valerian Ishmael to sort of say, no, 
I'm not going to have any more players. I'll muddle through with with what I've got. If you think this is Emmanuel Dennis is what we need, then I'll show you what it's like with with just him. Um, but having done that, and then the performances since January being pretty pretty relentlessly abject, it's not a difficult not a difficult with that sort of extra little bit of knowledge. It's not a difficult stretch, is it, to to imagine that Gino is just waiting to 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 fire him? I think. Someone must have talked him down. Because if, yeah, potentially. Who, who knows? Who knows what happened against? You know, we know the news came out, and Talksport said the news that he was on the edge of of losing his job. So somebody probably had to talk Gino down. Because hang on, no, maybe not now, maybe not. You know, to make him not do that, Jace. That run is is what one win in ten? Are we saying? Mm. Um, now there probably are other managers at better run football clubs that have been sacked this season for for runs like that. So in, if you look at it in isolation, it it kind of makes sense. But really, it just comes back to what Mike said at the very beginning. It's all about mm-hmm. the bigger picture. And how did we get here? How did we get to, to a, a state where we're only getting one win in 10 out of yeah. the group of players that we've got? It's yeah, it, So whilst we say... Has Gina had has he had to be talked down or, or talked one way or the other? Um, in yeah, in isolation, it's, it's not surprising it's happening. Bigger picture, again, probably not surprising that it's happening. I, th- I think the argument for for him not doing it is pretty bleak. I think the argument coming to Gina would have been, what's the point? What is the point mm-hmm. in sacking the manager when relegation? At that stage, two or two weeks ago, we're still looking unlikely. We can get through to summer. We can have a conversation there. What's the point in getting rid of a getting rid of another manager? I suspect that was the conversation that was had. And what what a dreadful situation that really is in it, it <laughs> is is to be in, isn't it? That the, the the season has just sort of meandered to well, from it's been a roller coaster, hasn't it? it always is with Watford, but the fact it's sort of we're meandering along just slightly out of control. The ship's a little bit rudderless and we can see the rocks of relegation in the distance. We're just about managing to plot a course clear of them for now, but it's just, oh, it's just, it's so frustrating and, and, and sad that it's, that it's ended up here. Um, but I still kind of think what, what is the point? Because unless Tom Cleverley is going to be the the long term answer, they they're just looking for that bounce just to get us get three four points, or maybe another couple of draws to to keep us in the division. And it's so short term. It is so it's so defeatist, really. And you could argue that that not getting rid of someone who has gone on a on a run like that is is defeatist. But I'd have much rather we could just to be honest, just got through to the end of the season and. And, and dealt with it and dealt with it then. But yeah, I think I think the argument would have been it's it doesn't really matter if you get rid of him. We if, as long as we get another win from somewhere, the football's gonna be naff. The the final third issues can be solved to a certain degree, but when you've only got um three strikers of, of varying quality you, you, can, you can only do you can only do so much. So it's just the whole thing is 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 incredibly incredibly dispiriting mm. and and the thread coming through it all is that it comes from the top. It comes from, from Gino Pozzo. Is he going to change? No, he's not going to change because he, because he, he just won't, because he would have done by now. If he was interested in changing the way he does things, he would have done it either after the cup final or the season we got relegated, really change things up and just look to freshen things, things up. But actually what's happened is since then there's been a, uh, a slow decline in an in investment um, and apparent interest. Um, it's, he's not going to change. So unless until there is a change at the top, which is very very difficult, I think we I think we just we're just going to bobble along. And it's we are. And the thing is, we we you know, we have to we have to bobble along, go to foot matches, and that's you know the, the the week by week stuff is the bit that's very important to lots of lots of football fans. Yeah, us included, we, us included. Yeah. That's so we, we've sort of what, but with Valerian, you know, what looking back, looking back on his achievements, let's say, and what he did add to this squad uh, and this this season, I suppose, Jason, for you, standout games, or, or is there something specifically you think he's he's added that we 
were severely lacking beforehand? I think there was a the discipline thing. I think it's probably an, an obvious one. I think that we've talked about sort of the, the um, sort of the fine structure, let's say that they had in place for and and the the disciplinary structure. Players that were meant to be in the starting eleven being dropped to the bench, subs being dropped from the squad completely if they were if, if they went out of line um, on team rules, um, and a bit of fight and a, and a likable team as well at the start of the season before Christmas. We were enjoying watching this team play, even if results didn't always go our way. You're actually sort of coming away from games going, oh, well, but I'm still looking forward to going again next week because we're enjoying watching the team play. And you kind of saw what they were trying to do. Um, and if you pick out, I think a, for a, the game that stood out for me and that sort of defines that was, was the Norwich game, the, the last home win in the league, <laughs> where we went 2-0 down, but we had the fight and the desire to come back and win that game 3-2, which we know would never have happened in the sort of previous three or four seasons. It just wasn't there. Um, so, yeah, I, it, that was good. It, and it's just such a shame that we seem so far away from that now with the same group of players and and, and, the, and, the, and the manager up until Saturday. Yeah, the, the discipline was the biggest bit for me, I suppose. But I think more than anything, it's the fact that, yes, loser was disciplined and he never was able to turn that around. But it, it does always feel like Valerian would be telling them off with his arm around them um, in yeah. in a way. And if you look at, again, I go back to what I said earlier about him, you know, Tom Delibishiru is is that thing. It's, he hasn't just pushed him away and gone, I don't know, like you, go away, and made someone feel like they're, they're in, you know, inferior. He's actually gone, look, you're yeah. bad. Tell him off. Look, keep them there. The and then when he's ready for him, and when he needs him to fill in at right back or not necessarily play the, his, his preferred role, he's there ready to do it. So that that balance, he he seemed to be finding. I think that's that was it for for me, Mike. Yeah, and I think I think it, it, that's a really really good example. We we we've been singing Tom Deli Bashiri's praises earlier on in the season. We were very much questioning him. Yeah. So I think that does show that what good man management can 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 do i mean there's obviously been question marks since about who's been who's been starting in various positions we we won't really know but on the face of it it looked like that discipline was something that had to be done it was done and then and the proof of the pudding uh, was in the eating wasn't it we could see it we could see it happening it looked like a team who is united and and relatively strong i think the best thing for me was uh, the opening day was great, QPR. We were ahead in, within it. a minute, um, which was one of the only times we've been ahead in a game, uh, according to the stats that uh, that Matt shared recently. But QPR was a good, great, fun start to the season. And we thought, OK, we, we might be in for some something a little bit different. And then it went wrong, didn't it? And there's those two games that I remember very, very clearly. I went up to Ellen Road and saw us capitulate at Leeds. They beat us 3-0 at a time where they were actually struggling at home. They might not even have won at home, uh, certainly for a, for a decent spell. Um, and Watford just folded in the in the face of of, of just a fast paced um, Leeds United, who were just ag- aggressive and on the front foot. And Watford just just melted. And then they followed it up with a game against Sunderland away, another you know another big stadium, another storied football club, another one with a, a big reputation and. A noisy crowd that was that was under lights on a, on a Tuesday, and again they looked haunted. They looked dead behind the you know much as they're looking like now. They looked they looked beaten before really they'd started. They looked like they were waiting to lose. And I was watching that game and thinking, Oosh, we are in deep deep trouble. We are we look for all the world like like relegation candidates, beaten before you start. And they turned it around. They really they went on a really decent run picking up points away from home some memorable wins away from home Blackburn last minute uh taking Preston apart close games Preston was much closer than than the than the goals that the score actually suggests and what we enjoyed about that was it it needed determination and strength and grit and standing shoulder to shoulder and they did that for for large periods so post Sunderland that that run was largely really, really entertaining. Um, if not entertaining, enjoyable because you could see that they were digging in. They were playing for the for the badge that's on the on the shirt, which is something that we've been desperate for, for as, as Watford fans for for so long. So I did enjoy that, which means that post Christmas and the New Year, it's made it all the harder to to take. You know, win away against QPR, win away against 
Rotherham, which was absolutely dismal. And the rest has been oh, abject. I mean, look at the home form. It'll be a minimum of 122 days. If we beat Leeds, it'll be 122 days since our last home league win. It's a sort of an abomination, really. Nowhere, what? nowhere near good enough. And the fact that it's gone from a team that we can be really sort of proud of and enthused by, even if they're not the finished article, even if they're short on quality, and even if we knew that they weren't really going to be um, competitive at the top end of the division, at least they were. They felt like a team we could get behind. And that has, they've just had it sucked out of them. And they they look haunted again. They just sort of... I, I don't fault them for effort. I don't think it's their fault. They just they are just so low on confidence. And to see them, you know, j- just shells of what they were earlier in the season again is it's, it's just been so disappointing. And I think that juxtaposition, it's so incongruous, the way they look now compared to the way they looked then. That's why I don't think anyone is surprised by the, you know, regardless of Gino Pozzo's history, I don't think anyone's surprised if you've watched Watford games in the past since January, since the turn of the year, you'd be going, yeah, well, as Dean Austin said. I was about to say. He's, <laughs> he's we, that message, yeah. the, um, I suppose that's, that's, the, you know, that's where we are. Um, and they're the things that we're worried about. But in terms of this last nine games of the season, Jason, what is it, do you think, that if you were a player, what is it you think if you're in, you're in training tomorrow and in comes Tom Cleverley, um, who has been around the ground, he's been coaching the, the young uns for the, uh, this year and been around the place for a long, long time. What is a player, do you think, like him, because a coach, former player like him, going to be able to do? And, and almost what do you think he needs to do in the next week? And then in the you know for the the final game, you, is he going to be fun fun Tom, or is he going to be hard to beat Tom, tough tough tough, tough you know tough tough player Tom? What do you reckon? I you get the impression that we've tried to be hard to beat so far this season, just with the sort of the lack of commitment going forward at times in recent games where we've lost confidence. We're, and, we're, and Mike's talked about us going into our shell. We we we've. We kind of sort of sit back and, and perhaps the team needs to be let off the leash a bit more. Mm. Um, whether Tom will do that or not, I don't know. I think there's, there's a big question there, isn't there? He's, he's got no coaching experience or managing experience at that level. He's been looking after the under-18s, doing reasonably well. He's got that cup final uh, that he got the got the guys to, didn't he, I think. There's a worry. My, I think my, my biggest concern is... Is the are we lacking leaders? Mm. Are the young players in the team not delivering because their confidence is suffering? If you look at the sort of the winning goal for for Cov on Saturday, there were big holes in that defence because runners had come through. I think who had been pulled wide. Porteous was left sort of one on one in the middle of the uh, the pitch on the 18-yard line. There's no one else around. Basically a one-on-one exercise. But, and I don't think there's much Porto could do and the ball ends up in the back of the net. Um, where were the midfield doing their jobs? Um, I think people called out Kone for that. I think he, he got shouted out by Porto afterwards. And it's those sort of players, players that we know have got promise, players that we've seen flashes of. Now, is the fact that Clares has done in people's eyes, a good enough job with the youngsters. Is he now the man to sort the, the youngsters in the first team squad out? I think it's a different, well, I'd say it's a different ball game. It's not a different ball game. It's still football, isn't it? But, mm. but it, it's, it's a different level, isn't it? It's a, it's a step up for cleverly as well as any players that sort of make that step up to the first team squad. And I'm just worried that can he, do what he needs to do with the youngsters whilst managing the team as a whole. I wonder if they'll look at the senior group in the first team squad and get them working closely with him. Will the likes of Livermore, maybe an Ince, with all that experience, will he be bringing them into sort of the coaching team or just helping him out sort of with the management of that first team squad to sort of keep them on side? Because I think it's, it does worry me a little bit. I think it's, it's a big ask for him, but yeah, hey, let's see what happens. Mike, do you reckon yeah. he's phoned Sir Alex Ferguson already? 
<laughs> I reckon I'm probably really well, good. boss. I'm now managing as well. <laughs> got, is that the Tom Cleverley impression we're going to get for the rest, that's, of, the, that's, uh, that's the rest of the season? Be useful. John, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I was going to mention his. Tom Cleverley has has pedigree in the game, doesn't he? He's been in some pretty major dressing rooms, both internationally and and domestically. He'll have seen how things work. He's obviously got a desire to coach otherwise there's no way a player with his sort of past is going to hang around at Watford with all the issues that we know are prevalent so it's obviously something that burns within him to go on and and, and do everyone's got to have their, their their first job he must have also known that there's a chance this is coming I suspect much like we we've been talking about we've been watching it for the past two or three weeks like a slow um, train wreck, really. Th- those guys aren't stupid. They'll they'll have been they'll have been talking about who might be the next cab off the rank and what might be the, you know, he might have well for all we know been teed up a couple of weeks ago because his name was, his name was on people's lips, wasn't it? To, after the after the Huddersfield game, so it it wasn't a surprise when Tom Cleverley was was announced. So how much he's been able to to get ready, we'll 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 never know. Of course, the first game is a massive one, as we said, away at Birmingham. Big old test. Wesley Hurt, who we've mentioned as one of the the senior players, played every minute of league football so far this season, is out because he's suspended. So that's another uh, another challenge he's he's got to face. So you'd hope that his stature means that he would get respect. You, you you'd think that players like that are liked and respected just because of that they've they players who have always done their talking on the pitch. They let their medals do the talk, and they let the re- record do the the talk. And they're not they're not flashy. I mean, he needs a blooming haircut, doesn't he? From what I can uh, from what I can gather. <laughs> so he's obviously focused on the on the task at hand. I mean, he's yeah, not on telly as but... much these days, is he? So he doesn't have to keep uh, keep that up. And that that's how you judge a good manager, isn't it? By whether <laughs> I think they need a haircut or or not. That's obviously if the, he turns yeah. up though at that first press conference and yeah. he's had a haircut, <laughs> I would do that. Would be brilliant. Thanks, thanks for listening, Tom. Um, so <laughs> it's look. We Jason has alluded to it. It is a gamble. It is a gamble. But I think the fact that he's been around the club, he knows the players, and hopefully knows what what buttons to press and uh, who to help them out. I think you're right. I think that Val named a, a, a senior leadership um, group, didn't he? And I think Tom Cleverley will be leaning heavily on those. Of course, there is. It did the the announcement from Watford did say his backroom staff was going to be announced in, in due course. So I wonder whether Craig you know, Cathcart? someone, sorry, <laughs> Craig <Cathcart? laughs> well, who, who is it? Who could it be? Well, I just wonder whether someone like Paul Robinson, who, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, d- who's got a bit of uh, Watford pedigree, something to get the fans sort of um, doubly on side, if you like, because I think from a, from a supporter's point of view, you'll struggle to find anyone that wouldn't wish Tom cleverly well. So he mm-hmm. starts off with, um, with 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 credit in the bank for sure. Paul Robinson, what's his coaching record like? I, I don't know. I haven't watched closely enough to to know the impact he's had on the teams. But what we do know is that he loves Watford. Fo- Watford fans love him. So perhaps as an extra sort of because the place needs a lift. Mm. The place needs a lift. We all need something. You know, I've been very, very, de- very just flat, flat. Not not sort of depths of despair, but just sort of just flat and. The, the ground, I thought, absolute credit to the Vicarage Road crowd on Wednesday night against against Swansea. Because when we got our equaliser, that was off the back of the crowd really getting going. Mm. And there wasn't really much to, to cheer about. It was a sparse crowd, as we as we saw. But the crowd recognised they needed lifting and got stuck in and, 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 and got Watford sort of to, to just to rouse them a little bit. But overall, you know, I, when, we, when you're walking up Yellow Brick Road slash Occupation Road yesterday, there's not really much anger. There's not no. really much sort of uh, recriminations or shouting. It's just sort of glum acceptance, which cannot be allowed to go on for for too long. And that part could be something to do with with the reason that the the, the decision was made at this stage as well. Because again, it looked like a a sparse crowd at Vicarage Road on 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 Saturday. I think we all know that the announced attendance is is slightly different from the actual attendance for 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 a number of reasons. People can't make it. People choose not to season ticket holders but you bought a ticket but you don't come but that's quite telling if you're Gino sat over the other side in the in the top tier of the the Graham Taylor stand and you look to your right you look to the left you look dead ahead and you're seeing big big pockets of empty seats I read Matt Matt Rousen's piece um, and 
it's quite it's quite a big thing for for you not to go and watch your team. Mm. That's a big step because how many times have we talked about protest? Very very rarely has a tick club managed to a, or a group managed to get people to walk out or to not turn up at all. It, it's a very very big step to not go and see your team, and the fact that people are choosing to take that step uh, with Watford in the way it is is a not surprising in the slightest. I woke up for the first time on Saturday in a very, 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 very long time and thought I could do without this, to be perfectly honest. Usually, I, I think the thought of Zed cars and it just seeing everyone and it, I, I'm there. I bolt out of my bed, loving it. Can't wait, whether we're bottom of the league, top of the league, Division 4, Division 1, whatever. I love it. But on Saturday, I was like, you know, I, I could do something better. Cheshire were away. Obviously, they lost. I'm glad I didn't travel down to uh, down there to see him. But that that kind of says where we're at. And mm. so, to my original point, the place needs a lift, and it's kind of a bit desperate because we need a lift and we need some points. And then, if the team are going to do well, we're going to have to play our part. And if we're going to play our part, the team have got to get us going. So, we need something to believe in again, um, because I think, like I said, at the at the top, at the highest level, I think we're in trouble. I think the direction this football club is going in is problematic in the extreme. I've got huge, huge concerns about the about the medium and long term future of Watford, but that is going to kind of have to wait. It's always bubbling underneath, but now it's going to have to wait because we're in such a slump, such a malaise, such a miserable state, and we still need points to make sure that we're not playing League One football next year. It's unlikely teams underneath us have got to play each other. But also, even if we are safe, we just want to go into summer f- sort of feeling like we've had something to get excited about and cheer again. So something had to happen. Something has happened. It's over to Tom Cleverley, whoever joins him on the on the dugout and in his coaching staff to get him going. And it's down to those players who have somehow got to find some fortitude and moral fibre and snap out of that malaise that funk that low low confidence that is just permeating everywhere at the moment things have got to change in the short term but things have also got to change in the long term at the top because if that doesn't change if we don't get that change at the top there really is very very little point about worrying who's in charge or who starts at right back in our next match lots and lots to go at (laughs) Plenty. But actually, there's this one thing coming up very soon, um, which might make you laugh. I don't know. Um, the WD18, uh, our friends who do that thing on that, their YouTube, um, because they're younger than us, um, right. they have got a special competition, game, uh, tournament. That's what I want, tournament. Uh, on the 23rd, Saturday, the 23rd uh, of March, it's International Weekend at, at West Hearts. Sports Club, you know, we're former home of Watford Football Club. Um, it's all Dave's event, um, seven aside tournament, basically. And yes, there is a from the rookery end team. Have we saw that properly yet, Mike? Or do I need to go and go? We'll see. I put it, I'll tell you this <laughs> I am not going in goal. <laughs> <laughs> As, we've got a, we've got a decent, we've got a decent team shaping up. It's, um, yeah, we've, we've scoured the, uh, we've, uh, Ben Mang has been out of work basically, so I've used <laughs> I've used him to sort of come up with a uh, a seven aside team for the uh, for the WD eighteen Cup. Real credit to those those guys. Mm. They work the, the things like this, and it kind of goes back to we we haven't mentioned stuff about. There's lots to be proud of about Watford Football Club. There is, you know, it was the her game two um, match day on um, on on Saturday, which as you'd expect, the club was was fully behind. Tremendous, lots of great initiatives. We know that, we and I, I think it is worth saying. But yeah, fair play to our fellow supporters who, are, who get off their backside and actually and actually do something. And WD eighteen are, are are doing that in the shape of this this fundraising tournament. It takes a lot of effort. It takes Loads. hours. It takes yeah, it takes effort. So so fair play uh, to them. We were looking forward to uh, entering a team of varying. Uh, sizes and, uh, and quality um, into into that will um, yeah be interesting to see how we get on. Hopefully, 
there isn't too much footage ending up on <laughs> online of, of us in action. I'm a bit worried. I'm a bit worried. I'm going to end up being the oldest player on the pitch. <laughs> there is that. I feel that there's that risk there. But hey, we we, we might get a goal I, head start. I might have to go and go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's on the 23rd, Saturday 23rd, um, then during the international break. Um, you can come down. You can you can uh, get involved. There's plenty of stuff going on. There's a raffle and auction if you go online right now. WD18 Cup dot charityhive.co.uk they've got some shirts very special shirts you can put some bids on and some hospitality stuff uh you can buy tickets uh via the you know online raffle tickets but at the actual event there's going to be a raffle there's going to be food there's going to be soft drinks family activities it's going to be a little bit of a fun day out um so do make your way down there if you can um they're not going to stream on their youtube channel are they i had a nightmare little feeling about that no hopefully not please not we won't allow it um uh, but um i have a chat to charlie uh, there and i might put on some tunes uh to keep everyone entertained um for a little bit but that's uh yeah do get down and if you can't get down do go to that website uh see the some of the things you can bid on uh wd18cup.charityhive.co.uk that's all to come in a few weeks time but we still have a game against Birmingham city at st andrews um next week and of course we'll have a discussion about that afterwards we find ourselves, as we know, uh, with a new head coach, one we know quite well, because we started this podcast, Mike, when he was a loney. We saw him Ooh. leave. We saw him become a player, a captain, a coach, and now a head coach. So it's sort of a lovely sort of circular thing a little bit, I suppose. So we'll see how Thomas, I think we have to call him Thomas now, don't we? Not Tom. Mr. Cleverly for me. Mr. So, uh, Mr. Cleverly, yeah. Yeah. Mr. So Cleverly. Uh, so Tom. Uh, and see who he does. Sir Nigel, could Sir Nigel come back? That'd be quite good. Never say never. Never say well, never. Decent, decent gig at Spurs. That is true. That is probably true. Nicer training ground as well. Might Before we go, John. Yeah. Can I? I just meant we mentioned there the sort of WD18 guys and and how those supporters are uh, are doing something incredibly worthwhile. Not everyone that listens to this this podcast is is online. Not everyone is uh, involved in in social media. And I think that the vast majority of Watford supporters probably aren't. Um, the vast majority of Watford supporters go to the game with their mates, with their families, with their loved ones, have a beer, have a pie, come home. But for those of us who are online, I think the last week or so has been pretty um, pretty tumultuous, let's put, it, let's put it that way. And I think one thing that I know for a, for a fact is that the majority of us, all of us really, want the, the best for, for what for the football club. We're all in it for the same reasons we all want our club to be um to be successful and solid and there for us that's what we that's what we want and i think over the past sort of week or so we've seen some i don't know it's just felt a little bit fractious out there and ultimately it's a plea to look you being a football supporter is a bit about it's, it's about passion we're all passionate that's why we give up our time other people do things in different ways other it, it's a passionate emotive experience supporting your football club but be nice, ultimately. Be nice, because we all want the same thing. You don't need to cut someone else down at the knee to get your point across. And if you do do that, you're probably not making it right. So my, yeah, just just be nice. You can be passionate. You can be strong-willed. You can have views that are diametrically opposed to mine without having to be unpleasant. And that's that's not aimed at any particular individual. It's the whole discourse is there's there's no need for it to degenerate into um, point scoring and, and and insults. You can be passionate and you can also be level headed. And look, I'm going to say it again: be nice. There's nothing wrong with it. Just don't be a dick. <laughs> well, I thought you were going to go there. The <laughs> parking family motto. Um, thank you very much, Michael, for your time. Cheers, guys. Good luck, Tom, Mister Cleverly, and thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back with more from the Recruins. Uh, actually, later on this week, uh, I've done an interview with the guys from Watford Treasury, uh, and their new book uh, about the 1970s is out. Uh, you can get it from the Hornet Shop and online at watfordtreasury.co.uk. Um, but we'll put links and stuff. We'll put some stuff on our socials and stuff where you can find that. But uh, it's a lovely little book, so do have a look for that as well. But more uh, about that book in a podcast we'll bring out on Thursday. Uh, but thank you very much for listening uh, thank you for uh, just trying to be as nice a what fan as you can be uh, and uh, for well just putting up with it all come on you horns